deals with two topics, the first being trust and their ramifications to co-op boards. Our speaker on that topic is Dorothy Finger, so we will begin the program with Dorothy. Dorothy is an attorney with the White Plains, White Plains based law firm of Finger and Finger, a professional corporation. The firm serves as chief counsel to the Cooperative and Condominium Advisory Council, as well as, as well as to its parent organization, the Building and Realty Institute. Dorothy is an expert in several areas, including real estate law, certiorari proceedings, co-op and condo law, labor law, wills, trust and estates, and landlord-tenant law. She is a member of several important local associations, including the Westchester County Bar Association, the Westchester County Tax Commission, the Human Rights Commission of Westchester County, and the League of Women Voters. She has contributed many times to our association's council corner in Impact, the official publication of the BRI, and she has been a participant in several panel presentations on several topics related to our membership. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dorothy Finger. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jeff, for the great introduction. Thank you to the organization for having me here. Um, I have to give my uh, excuses up front for anything that's wrong with my presentation. First of all, Somebody already commented, the rest of the finger team has abandoned me. Yeah. <laughs> Three partners, none of them are here for moral support. They saw that I was coming and they found other obligations that they could take care of. In addition, we previously written about this topic in impact, so some of you are familiar with the topic from that. This is true. Thirdly, mm -hmm. uh, okay. Is that better? Okay. Yes, Thirdly, this topic is a close second to tax certiorari in the boring field. In that category, maybe the tax certiorari is more boring, but this is pretty dull. Uh, I have to tell you, the other one is that there are some esteemed attorneys here as well, so I know they're going to be very critical of everything I have to say. So having made my excuses, uh, there's one more. Uh, I have to correct um, Jeff on one thing. I am not a, a trusts and estates attorney. In fact, I stay, as far as drafting those things, I stay about as far away as I can. Because, the, I'll explain later, but the motivations for those things really have to do a lot with the tax code, and I want to stay far away from IRS and the tax code. It's very complicated, and I don't get into that area. But it's not so bad that I'm not a, a tax, uh, an estate tax and a state's and trust attorney because it has its pluses. As Justice Frankfurter once said, he doesn't know uh, to, how to define pornography, but he knows it when he sees it. And likewise, I can't really do a trust to the, the way it should be done with all the ramifications and understanding all about the tax code and Social Security and Medicare and all of those issues. But I do know co-op and condo law. And I know when I look at a trust how to read it enough to know if there's an issue there that's going to affect the way in which a co-op or condo functions with regard to its residents and sales. Those are the two categories that we're really concerned with. So when I look at it that much, I do know. And I look at it from that perspective, which for your purposes is what you want. Uh, so I'm going to start really to have you help me. It's going to be a little interactive because there are some analogies here to sublet policies. How many of you have sublet policies? Your buildings. Okay, so a fair amount. And what is it about subletting, I'm going to make a list over there, that concerns you when you de determine that you will allow subletting in your building? 
What are the things that you want to protect against? Anybody? Anybody? Yes. Is she going to use this? Okay. Okay. So the sublet, one thing is, what else? Pay maintenance. That's one issue. Okay. What else? What else is of concern? Protecting the property from becoming an investment property. Okay. Investment. Versus living, we call it. Anything else? Compatibility of the short term. Okay. Okay. Compatibility. What else about? The uh, aside from compatibility, you want to know who's yeah. overall control? Okay, control. And yeah. Who's going to live there? Uh huh. Who's I'm living there? Right. Good. Okay. <laughs> we can use all the help you're going to get. Okay. In unit. Okay. If you look at that list, as I go through the issues that I present to you, you will see that a lot of it is very similar. There are differences, and we'll address those. But those are the concerns, and, and those concerns are valid with regard to trust. And I will explain why that is. First of all, what you need to know about trust is that very much, like most of the law, they're fictions. Real estate law is a fiction. Real estate is divided into you know, fee ownership, uh, rental, co-op, condo, and all of those are a fiction. They're a fiction of common law. They're a fiction of the legislature to change the various rights with regard to property. And likewise, trusts are a fiction. They are a fiction that deal with uh, the control of assets. And the control of assets, how they're dealt with for various purposes. Okay? So generally speaking, not always, but for the most part, trusts are designed for several purposes. One is to deal with estate taxes. That's the, the very common one because people with money decide they don't want Uncle Sam to get as much as Uncle Sam might get if it's not in a trust. Another issue is to avoid probate. And I'm not going to go into whether it's a valid consideration or not or what I think about it, but it's become a theme to avoid probate, put your assets into a trust. And another one is sometimes legitimate concern is when uh, there is somebody in, in a family member that's under a disability and you want to protect that person and their assets from government invasions of their assets and other reasons. One of the reasons for trusts are valid for those particular individuals. They may be smart in this situation or not smart, but they're valid concerns. So what kinds of trusts commonly come to a board where a shareholder says, I want to put my apartment, my unit, into a trust? Well, one is called a Cupid trust, and that's a short version uh, of the, the anachronism, anachronism for Qualified Personal Residence Trust. Now, qualified personal residence trusts are, again, a fiction. Those, that's really for estate planning. And the government allows you to put property in trust uh, for a period of time, and the beneficiaries of that trust will get that property at a discounted value 
over a period of years. That's a shorthand version of explaining it. So what are the issues in that type of trust? And it's not as common as the other, but I think it gives you a good example of the sublet issues and how they relate. Uh, generally speaking, in a Cupid trust, or very frequently, the person who put the property into the trust is still alive when the trust term ends. So now the trust is owning the unit, somebody else is living in it. So who has control of the stock and the occupancy of the apartment at that time? Now you have other issues that could come up. Uh, in addition, the main thing for all trusts is, trusts are legal entities. As I said, they're fictions. They're not an individual. Co-ops were designed for individuals to purchase and live in. You sign a proprietary lease in an individual name. You get stock in an individual name. You pay the maintenance out of your income or your assets. And in a, in a trust, the shareholder is reserving the right to be there for a period of time. But the board has to confirm through some type of agreement that only the shareholder can be there, not somebody else that the trust designates at some point. So that's the issue of who's, who's living there, right? Who's going to live there? So we need an agreement about that. That's, that's where the co-op attorney gets involved, OK? Uh, it should be noted that most, um, and the most Cupid laws, there's a certain amount of cash that can be held by the trust. If that's in, in there, then what happens if that money runs out? If, that, if that's only a certain amount of money that's going to be put into that trust, and the trust is going to be responsible for paying, what happens? Talking about paying maintenance, right? So we need to have an agreement as to having other money put into the trust, having a guarantor, having other ways to secure the payment of maintenance. Because the trust itself may or may not have the resources or the rights that the trustees have may interfere if they can spend the money for other things, if there's income, and so forth. So, uh, we need to have that taken care of in an agreement. We also need to have something that tells us who the beneficiaries are and not allow them to just move in at the termination of a trust. Because a Cupid trust is for a fixed term. So again, that goes to who's living there and control. Uh, so, there are issues then about the death, on the death of the uh, 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 individual who's putting the property into trust, because then the trust ceases to exist. So then, when the trust ceases to exist, that situation is going to be just as if a shareholder dies. You have to have control over the transfer. You can't just let the trustees do what they want. Uh, that doesn't really work in, in, our, in our environment, okay? The other type of trust is called the grantor uh, revocable living trust. And the issues are similar. The, the trusts are somewhat different in that they're used more for estate uh, planning to transfer assets without probate. I mean, they don't want to get into the probate situation. But the issues are the same. Uh, it's ownership, occupancy, transfer, the guarantees of payment, it's all the same. And so we have uh, a series of documents when we are presented with these issues that we prepare for the uh, uh, person who is going to put the property in trust, for the trustees, for guarantors. There are several documents that uh, we prepare that will protect as best you can. Now, some of the things that you know you have to understand is that there are other types of considerations, like who's going to vote the shares at a, at a meeting, right? Well, it's going to be a trustee. The trustee doesn't live there, so you know maybe they don't vote at all. Then you may have issues of uh, you know a quorum 
or a proxy, who they're giving the proxy to, those are more difficult to address in an agreement in restricting the right of a, uh, of a trustee, but it is a valid concern. Most often, I think, trustees kind of just don't care about the annual meeting. But if there are issues of increased maintenance and they don't like that because they don't want to spend more on this unit, it's possible that they could uh, raise those issues and, and be vocal about it. Um, so uh, there are all of those uh, concerns. There are also issues of whether or not to pay a flip tax on that transfer. That would be up to the board to determine uh, and other charges. Um, so those are the basic concerns and the, the kinds of issues that we face. So the next time somebody in your building asks you, you know, I just want to put it into, it's just a simple trust, I just want to put it into, why can't, can I put it into trust? Um, the answer is, first the board will have to decide whether or not you're permitting it, and if you do, what the conditions will be, whether your attorney's going to have to draft certain agreements or what they will have to consent to in order to uh, enable that process to take place. So that is the, the short form of um, trusts and co-ops. And condos, I might add, I'll anticipate a question, I don't know if it's here. Obviously, it, it pertains less to condominiums because they don't have that same kind of control. But they do have a right of first refusal. So it could be that in a certain instance they would want to see what's involved in this trust, what the assets are, if, if there are guarantees of any sort, uh, before they decide whether or not they're going to exercise the right of first refusal. There was an interesting article in the Times a few weeks ago about how co-ops are becoming more like condos and condos are becoming more like co-ops. And this is one of the areas that I think is kind of, it's, it's beneath the surface right now, but I think as time goes forward, it might blossom. So, any questions? Yes, sir. Do uh, board decisions with with regard to whether or not to allow uh, an asset unit to be put into a trust, um, give rise to potential like, discrimination claims when one when a board says, "Okay, we'll allow that unit to go into a trust," but then they decline to allow another unit to go into a trust. And uh, yeah, he wants to know if there's exposure if the board allows somebody to put it into trust and somebody else not to put it into trust. I don't. How many examples where a board has done that? I think that what we have done and what we've advised is first the board makes a decision. Are we going to permit it? And if they're going to permit it, they say, we'll permit it, but it has to go through finger and finger, and whatever agreements they want, that's what you have to do. So it's sort of self-selecting. There are people who don't want to do what we want them to do. After they pay us to go through it all, at the end of the line, they say, no, no, we don't want to sign those documents, and they don't do it. But I don't think that's discrimination, because we're giving everybody the same bite at the apple. And then one follow-up question. When you say a trust doesn't pay its maintenance fees, and you have to take the trust to court, and you sue the right. trust, is it harder or easier? Does it not really matter when you're court? Well, I think, it, yeah, it wants to know if it's harder to sue the trust. Um, no, because, well, because we have all this documentation that not only does the trust provide, usually that they have to pay the bills and so forth in general, but we have specific agreements that say the trust will be responsible. We want the, the board is entitled to, before they approve it after these items to see what assets are in the trust to make sure that there's enough and to control provisions that control some of the spending so, and guarantees. We ask for some personal guarantees. So it's it's really, I don't think, any harder. It's going to be a non-payment proceeding or a foreclosure proceeding, depending on the circumstances. It might get a little bit you know, more complicated. You get more parties involved. But we haven't, to date, haven't had that problem. Uh, you know, it's, it's new, in a sense. It's a few years that this has been growing as a, as a problem solver for people. And I guess we'll see down the road if it foments any kind of litigation. Yes? Are there any singular uh, litigation issues with respect to either grant 
mentors or um, trustees living at a state, you know, living at a state? Well, we put in that it has to be jurisdiction is here. The grantor can't be living out of state. The grantor, that's part of this deal, is that the grantor has to live in the apartment. Because we're just not going to let the trust decide who's living there. And we put in phrases, for example, uh, that say that if the person, grantor is there, and they say they go to a nursing home, that if they're not living in the apartment for more than a certain period of time, then either they have to move back for whatever, or it has to be transferred, it has to be sold. Uh, you know, we try to cover a lot of those bases. Anybody else? Yes? Would you say that most um, co-ops vote not to have a trust clause, and if they vote yes to a trust clause, is it necessary to have a lawyer that's well versed in trust? Well, okay. Part one, when I say most allow it, don't allow, I can't really speak to that. Uh, our buildings are kind of split, and I don't have, I haven't taken a survey of the, the council, you know, and all the people. As to whether or not they need, the co-op needs an attorney, first of all, I'm going to say what I tell people, anybody who says, do you need a lawyer, I say, well, would you go into the operating room without the surgeon? So, you know, I think, you know, that's what I do. So you're asking me, do you need me? And I say, you need me. But not being flip about it either. I'm just saying, I think, but you do. Because you can say yes to the trust, but if you don't have all of these agreements, then you have no protection. Then you don't control who's living there. See, that's the difference. A trust is not a person. So you don't control who's living there. You don't have any guarantees about the payment of the maintenance. You haven't uh, looked to see who's going to be living there under certain circumstances or with this individual. You have no control over anything. You're just saying, okay, transfer to a trust and let the chips fall where they may. So I don't think that's a particularly good idea for co-ops who want these protections. Anybody? Yes? Actually, our attorney advises that we don't have any trust. If a child wants to go along with their parent, they'll allow that. Well, that's a different issue. It's, it's probably you don't have to have trust. And as I said, you know, you can or you cannot. Uh, I'm not advocating to have trust, but the legitimate part of it is that there are people who are advised by their attorneys to put their assets in one form of a trust or another. And they feel, some of them feel very strongly about it because they say, you know, I want to do this, I need to do this, my attorney says I need to do this, and why won't the co-op let me do it? So some co-ops say, well, you know, we want to keep our shareholders happy, it's even the ones who want this, but if they want it, then we have to be protected too. That's kind of a hedge of an answer, but it's the best I can do. Yes. Trusts are a little new, but but you can write things to protect the co-op, to put the co-op in virtually the same position as it is when you have the individual living there. And as we all get older, junior my age those things. As we get older, we, we, we're all starting to think about estate planning, and it's not just trusts, it's limited, limited uh, liability companies, I, I think the co-op should be a little more flexible in figuring out how they can accommodate the, 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 the needs of the individuals. Uh, and speaking of talking with some of the considerations, the bottom line is you can write it up to protect the co-op. Anybody else? Going once, <laughs> going twice. Thank you very much, everybody.